So good morning, everyone. And I invite uh, Professor Massimo Grilli to join me here. I welcome you all this morning to our third session of this exciting conference. I thank once more the organizing committee for all the organization of the conference. And this morning's topic will be theology in biblical exegesis. And the desired goal is to offer theoretical and practical indications on how to elaborate the theology of biblical texts. And the session, as yesterday, is split into two parts, a general approach to the issue until 10.30, and then we shall come back after a tea break and have a panel discussion on specific approaches. So I see now our first speaker who is joining us online. Um, welcome. Uh, the first speaker is Raimund Beringer, Emeritus Professor of New Testament Exegesis at the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies at KU Leuven. Among his recent publications in 2019, he co-edited the volume Spirit, Hermeneutics, and Dialogues, exploring their interconnectedness. This morning, he will deal with a crucial topic, exegesis as the soul of theology. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. I will begin by sharing my screen. And uh, please, if there is any technical problem, please uh, stop me immediately. I hope you can see my screen now. We can see the screen, but I don't know if the, uh, no, no, there is some problem with the audio. Can you hear me properly? Mm, yes. And I did not understand what is uh, what is the problem? No, I, I, I guess we do not have any problem anymore. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation and this opportunity to share with you on this topic. Um, I'd like to begin with a verse from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, 4, 15 verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So exegesis as a soul of theology seems still to be a very attractive image in a broad spectrum of uh, theologies, but it also seems a rather vague image, and it's often used in a decontextualized way both decontextualized from its uh, context in Dei Verbum 24 and from its historical development. And I think there are certain dangers uh, that come with that uh, for the role of the study of scripture and theology. And that is my uh, begin situation where I begin. I will basically focus on the anima sacra theologia, as it is expressed in the Verbum 24, in a contextual approach, in a diachronic analysis, and in a synchronic analysis. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not sure whether I will get to my second point of the reception history of um, the Verbum 24 in Verbum Domini, but we will see how time is evolving, and we will focus on some strengths and weaknesses. So to remind all of us, um, <clears throat> I have uh, actually subdivided the Verbum 24 into three parts, and so it begins with sacred theology rests on the written word of God together with sacred tradition as its perpetual foundation by scrutinizing in the light of faith all truth stored up in the mystery of Christ. Theology is most powerfully strengthened and constantly rejuvenated by that word and the Verbum 24, 2. For the sacred scriptures contain the word of God, and since they are inspired, really are the word of God, and so the study of the sacred page ought to be as the soul of sacred theology. And the Latin text is Idioque sacre pagine 
Studium Sit Veluti Anima Sacre Theologiae. And you see here that will be important in a moment that there is a footnote referring us to um, encyclicals by Pope Leo XIII and Pope Benedict XV. But the text does continue in Deo Verbum 24 uh, in the third part by the same word of scripture, the ministry of the word also, that is pastoral preaching, catechetics, and all Christian instruction in which the liturgical homily must hold the foremost place, is nourished in a healthy way and flourishes in a holy way. So for a contextual analysis, it is important to realize that Dei Verbum 24 is part of the last chapter, chapter 6 of Dei Verbum, which is entitled Sacred Scripture in the Life of the Church, subdivided in sections 21 to 26. So the content here is the question, trying to answer the question, how can scripture be made available and accessible to the people? We need to keep that in mind as the actual context of the image of the soul. And so if we go through <clears throat> chapter 6, we see that in uh, number 24, scripture is presented as the supreme role of faith for the life of the church. In number 22, uh, easy access to scripture by suitable and correct translations is encouraged. In 23, the contribution of Catholic exegetes to the training and formation of, I quote, as many ministers of the divine word as possible to provide the nourishment of the scriptures for the people of God is uh, underlined. And then comes our text 24, which is about how scripture gives life to theology and to the ministry of the word. And then the text continues with the focus on priests, deacons, and catechists as the ministers of the word, and all the faithful should frequently read the scriptures. And finally, the last section, uh, 26, uh, where the Conciliar text expresses the hope that the treasure of revelation may fill people's hearts. So the content of the Verbum 24 could be described as follows. The relationship of theology and scripture in view of the ministry of the word in the life of the church and theology is seen as part of the church's mission to proclaim the word of God. If we uh, look at the structure, you see of the Verbum 24 itself, it starts with uh, describing the relationship between sacred theology and the written word of God. So it speaks about the truth stored up in the mystery of Christ. In the second section, the relationship between sacred theology and the study of the sacred page is emphasized. And in the third section, the relationship between the word of scripture and the ministry of the word is emphasize. Here in this context, the text uses several images. First, the image of foundation. So uh, emphasizing a powerful strengthening and a constant rejuvenation. Then in the second section, our image that we are focusing on today is mentioned, the soul. And finally, in the last, there are the images of nourishment and flourishing agent. So that is the first part about the contextual analysis. We will now move to the second part, the diachronic analysis of the particular section that we are interested in that I call De Verbum 24-2D. Now, I guess uh, I do not need to go into all the background of De Verbum, but it is well known that there was first a so-called schema C that was called De Fontibus Revelationes, and there, under number 29, uh, under the title about the relationship of theology to sacred scripture, uh, we can actually already read something about the anima, the soul. I have here the Latin text. Um, I will immediately go to the, an English translation of this text. Um, Since sacred scripture, together with tradition, should be like the soul of all theological instruction, and since the sacred teachings are always rejuvenated by the study of both sources, the greatest teachers of theology should generate the growth of the proper teaching, which comes forth from the correct interpretation of the sacred books. So this is the text that you could say is the earliest precursor in the history of uh, De Verbum, how it came about, 
and you see that it is already focused on um, yeah the um, sacred scripture together with tradition should be like the soul of all theological instruction. Um, you see here that scripture and tradition are mentioned together. That is a characteristic of this uh, document. Now, we also know that on the 21st of November 1962, Pope uh, John XXIII had Schema C removed from the discussion and a new commission was uh, called together. And on the 22nd of April 1963, they sent out a new schema to the Council Fathers, uh, Schema D. And interestingly enough, Schema D has no reference to the soul of theology. Here, uh, D24 is entitled Sacred Theology Rests on the Word of God. And I again have here the Latin text and we go to an English translation. But the science of sacred theology stands on the word of God as on its primary and inalienable foundation. So you see the image of foundation is already here and draws from it arguments by which it is most powerfully strengthened and always rejuvenated. So also the rejuvenation, which is in the final text, is already here, but nothing about the soul. In place of it, we have this phrase and draws from it arguments. The text continues, and you see both a Latin and uh, an English translation, for the sacred scriptures not only contain the word of God, but they truly are the word of God because of this, the ministry of the word of God and so on also. In the next phase, after a lot of discussion and a lot of suggestions of how to improve this text, we then see the following in schema E, E24, in English then, sacred theology rests on the revealed word of God written and handed down as on its primary and perennial foundation. By this word, it is most powerfully strengthened and always rejuvenated by scrutinizing in the light of faith all the truths which is stored up in the mystery of Christ. And then the text continues with the reintroduction of the image of the soul, but the sacred scriptures contain the word of God and they truly are the word of God. And for this reason, the study of the sacred page ought to be as the soul of theology. And this element is then not changed until the final form. So it remains the same as it is here. Idiocus sacre patina studium sit veluti anima sacre theologiae. So what can we conclude from this uh, in this part? Um, well, the statement about the soul of theology is added in schema E at the moment when uh, the uh, text and it draws from it arguments is removed and by scrutinizing in the light of faith all the truth which is stored up in the mystery of Christ is introduced. So. That is very important that the uh, formulation and draws from it arguments so that the scriptures would be kind of a, uh, a source of drawing arguments uh, for theology. Uh, that way of thinking is removed and there is the place where the soul comes in. The second conclusion, the statement about the soul of theology is connected with the previous sentence by and for this reason, idioque. This means precisely because the sacred scriptures truly are the word of God, the study of the sacred page should be like the soul of theology. That is important to note. Now, <clears throat> what would be the background of the soul image? We see that it was already very briefly, uh, it was already um, in, the, <clears throat> in Providentissimus Deus uh, and a short reference to Providentissimus Deus in Spiritus Paraclitus. Um, this is in fact indicated in a footnote that was added in Schema G, so all the way at the end. Um, and we should also not forget that the reference to the soul of theology is also found in another conciliar document about priestly formation of Tatam to Tius 16. So in the interest of time, we'll be very short here about Providentissimus Deus, but we see that uh, there, uh, 
we have the Latin and the English text. On the other hand, this is most desirable and necessary that the use of the same divine scripture flows into the entire teaching of theology and becomes nearly its soul. Where did Providentissimus Deus find this? Um, I think that uh, Jose Lera is right by uh, pointing out that uh, the first trace of the soul uh, image goes back to Decree 15 of Rule 5 of the 13th General Congregation of the Society of Jesus already in 1687, where we read, and finally, in order that this sacred instruction may be as the soul itself of true theology. I think you see that it's, uh, again, a uh, context of education, formation of future priests. So, you see here, uh, the knowledge of the scriptures is the soul of true theology, is the emphasis here. And that uh, comes from Rudolphus Corneli in his introduction to the Old Testament books from 1885, which may have been the bridge between the Jesuit text and Providentismus Deus. Uh, I will skip optatum to tears in the interest of time. Um, <clears throat> now, in order to understand the anima, of course, we need to also look at how soul, the soul image, is used in other texts of the Council. Because the question is, yeah, what is the understanding of the soul-body relationship uh, that we find? And so there's a very interesting uh, quote in Lumen Gentium 38, quoting from the Epistle to Diagnetus 6, uh, quote, anima est in corpore hoc sint in mundo Christiani, what the soul is in the body that are Christians in the world. And in Gaudium et Spes 40, we have, thus the church goes forward together with humanity and experiences the same earthly lot as the world does. She serves as a leaven and as a kind of soul for human society as it is to be renewed in Christ and transformed into God's family. So what actually does uh, change uh, in, con in comparison to uh, Providentissimus Deus 16? Uh, the two clauses of Providentissimus Deus are uh, reduced into one, uh, leaving out the first verb, so flows into and is nearly the soul, becomes is nearly its soul. They change the word use to study, and they change nearly to the comparative particle as. So you see here the quick comparison of the different um, forms of the text in the different uh, stages and the source and the different stages of the composition of the verbum. Yeah, how does uh, that context clarify what the soul means? Uh, I think that in the uh, Jesuit text, uh, it is an educational context. The importance of the training of the scholastics in sacred scripture is emphasized. It is about the exalted status of sacred scripture. So the soul of theology image is found in exactly the same context in the work of Corneli, which we think is the bridge. And then in Privita, uh, Providentissimus Deus, um, we see that uh, the use of the same divine scripture flows into the entire teaching of theology. The sacred books hold such an eminent position among the sources of revelation that without their assiduous study and use, theology cannot be placed on its true footing or treated as its dignity demands. So with the image of the soul, Leo XIII wants to illustrate the eminent position of the scriptures and the dignity of theology. Um, yeah, there's not much new here in uh, the text of Benedict the Fifteenth. We can skip that for the interest of, uh, in the interest of time. And also Octatum to Tius. Um, we just conclude here: the students are to be formed with particular care in the study of sacred scripture, which ought to be, as it were, the soul of all theology. You see, it is again the educational purpose, but nothing much that is new.
yeah, dogmatic theology should be so arranged that the biblical themes are presented first. So you see the uh, priority. Um, in yeah, De Verbum uh, itself, the context makes uh, the Bible available and accessible as widely as possible, training of ministers of the word of God and inviting all Christian uh, faithful to read the sacred scripture. Uh, in the Reverend 25, the soul image is connected closely to the understanding of the sacred scriptures as truly being the word of God. And the soul image is part of a network of other images. It adds a dynamic aspect to the static image of the foundation. We can also ask ourselves, why do they use the word sacred page here and not sacred scripture? Um, that's the only time that uh, sacred page is used, Sacra Pagina, in uh, the entire text of the uh, Second Vatican Council. Um, I think that maybe this text of Daniel Harrington in the introduction to the commentary series, Sacra Pagina, can help us. Uh, so the expression Sacra Pagina originally referred to in the text of scripture in the Middle Ages, it also described the study of scripture to which the interpreter brought the tools of grammar, rhetoric, dialectic, and philosophy, thus Sacra Pagina encompasses both the text to be studied and the activity of interpretation. So we conclude that there is continuity and discontinuity. The continuity is the soul image has constantly been part of an educational context. The study of scripture should be part of all the dimensions of the teaching of theology. And two, despite many variations in the formulation, the basic structure of the statements is more or less the same. Three, the soul image is mostly expressed with the inclusion of certain distance, nearly or as. It's not completely identified. It's a comparison. It's a simile. And four, the soul image is not stated as a fact, but as something desirable. Discontinuity, one, um, it has used, it was used uh, within different understandings of the concept of soul, uh, moving from like the neo-scholastic context of Leo the 13th to the personalist view of Gaudium et Spes. Um, two, it was used to describe or legitimate very different understandings of the relationship between scripture and theology, from priority of theology to priority of scripture. And three, it was used with a very different understanding of what was meant by theology, teaching theology, and its subdisciplines, especially focused on dogmatic theology. So very briefly, before I conclude, um, a short uh, synchronic reading of De Verbum 24. Um, so we have two poles that are compared. The first pole is called sacred theology. The second pole is called word of God or scripture, sacred scripture, sacred page ministry of the word and yeah the relationship between scripture and the word of god is first described in terms of containment and then in terms of being is the word of god and uh, third observation synchronically is that the image of the soul is a network of many images uh, we have them here the foundation the rejuvenator and then the soul I do not think that we will have the time to look into Verbum Domini uh, and how it received uh, the uh, text. It's very complicated. And uh, so we immediately go to the last part. Um, strengths and weaknesses. We have already talked about uh, strengths. Let me first give a quick preliminary remark uh, as our Investigation has demonstrated the soul image is used in official Catholic texts for the relationship between scripture study and theological studies, and only in a secondary and shorthand way to the relationship between sacred scripture and theology. Therefore, our third part will focus on yeah, the relationship between scripture study and theological studies. What does the simile of the soul say about the relationship between scripture and the word of God and theology? It talks about primacy, importance, the divine nature, penetration, hermeneutics of faith, uh, and yeah, the ecclesial community. So number one, uh, 
going now to the limitations uh, and limits. Um, first, the body-soul dualism is at times still at work when we use this image. It implies that the theological meaning is seen as uh, all too separate from the historical dimensions and ultimately seen as much more important. And I think that's something that maybe we need to be careful to avoid. Two, there's a static interpretation as a limitation or a danger to the soul image implies that scripture study and theology form a body-soul unity in which theology is assigned the role of body. This may be the case for the theology of scriptures, but does not have to be the case for all later theology, especially in view of the greater works, we could say, of John 14, 12. So we can ask, does it not make theology and theologizing too dependent on the study of scripture in a one-sided way? There's a danger of moralizing interpretation. The soul image can be used to moralize against interpretations which are judged as not fulfilling the criterion of doing justice to the inspired character of scripture. There's maybe even a danger of absolutizing. The soul image runs the risk of absolutizing the revelatory inspired character of scripture by allowing us to forget that we can never access the soul in a pure form, but only in and through its embodied appearance which are appearances, which are its revelation and its veiling. And there's also the danger of romanticizing or idealizing interpretations. The soul imagery runs the risk of creating an idealized image of scripture, not leaving room for what Verbum Domini 42 calls the obscure and difficult passages of the Bible and what the inspiration of the truth of sacred scripture calls challenges. And so with that, I would like to conclude by thanking you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bieringe, for clarifying us the history, meaning and challenges of this image of the, the Bible, a soul of biblical theology or theology. Uh, okay, I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions and comments, but we will have a question and answer time at the end of this first session.